Oh, ah, cool. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll go ahead and just kind of jump through here. Um, I'm going to kind of go through my slides fairly quickly because I've got uh, kind of a laundry list and starting out with the uh, meeting as we did here with Bill LaPenta and all, you know, we started talking about making sure that we have requirements rather than uh, solutions. And so kind of some of what I'm going to be throwing in here is a little bit of solutions. I've got some other things that uh, I've, I want to talk about in here too that kind of comes at the end. And I do apologize for being a little off key with everything. I was gone for two weeks, then Thanksgiving vacation, so I kind of had only one week to put things together. So I want to thank you guys for uh, helping set me straight on where I needed to go and all that. So um, thanks for that. Uh, next slide here. Um, I'll kind of look back up here. I guess I probably should have done like everybody else, put these into more slides than I did. But what are the biggest challenges that we've got? Uh, you know, observations to provide uh, sufficient verification of events as well as how do we uh, validate and uh, verify everything that we've got going on out there. We tend to use uh, satellite data sets as best as we can, you know, altimetry, geo, and leo, because we just don't have a whole lot in the way of um, service observations and all that. So, um, you know, one of the things that I was kind of happy to hear yesterday was uh, Jeff Domingo stating that, you know, we are going to get the uh, HER and the, and the HURRY <clears throat> eventually at the uh, same resolution and same temporal as the rest of the mainland. I've, I've, I've got another image I want to pop up here in a little bit, because uh, it doesn't show the her and all that as it reaches over the mainland, I mean, and Alaska. So I want to see how that is supposed to actually reach out over the, the Hawaiian Islands and all that, because I know that's kind of where it's going to hit first. So I'm and that doesn't have to be done in this one. I just would somebody can help me out with how that's going to be done. Give me a timeline and what the grid and all that's going to look like. I was really, really appreciative of that. Uh, so, but, you know, I mean, it was good to see that the wrap finally gets over us. But one of the bigger problems that we have out there and challenges that we have is we got to have, ter you know, rather than convective resolution, for us it's more of a terrain resolution issues that we deal with and from what we've been told um, from forecasters and even the university, really to get down to that kind of resolution, we've got to be able to do that at about a uh, um, two, one and a half, two kilometer resolution model just to where we can really get in there to start uh, seeing the issues we got, because especially in the Hawaiian Islands, because it's more just um, low level cloudiness that comes in with the trade showers. That, it really isn't convection that causes the flooding problems and everything else that we have out there. Um, does the current production suite and products adequately help you address these challenges? <clears throat> Currently, no. As I just mentioned, you know, we, we really got to get down to uh, much lower resolution in order to be able to do that. Um, I do want to throw a shout out to the Meg. Um, you know, you guys are finally we're getting some things done there to where you know you're helping us um, help go back and look at some. Uh, things that has happened in the past and bring that out. I think OHO was one that was done here recently and that really did help us out there with that and that, that was very beneficial. Is the current amount of available guidance too much, too little, or just the right amount? Um, I, I want to step back to something I heard um, AWC say yesterday that I really resonated with. <clears throat> I, I think, you know, Getting it out there, getting it all together into you know fewer models and something that you know, really has everyone's requirements in there, and then having the tools to data mine it out, whether you live in Alaska or out in the Pacific or in the mainland, Puerto Rico, you know, so that it's easier to you know everyone to work off of one one um, um, set of modeling that uh, really has the requirements set in it for everyone else. So I think that's that, that's really Great, because we don't have a whole lot out there. I mean, it's like as I have here, one of our guys out there, he says, well, we really all we get to use is the GFS, GFS, or the GFS. Um, so, you know, but I, that's not necessarily a bad thing if it's got everything in it that needs to be there. Now, what do you need in terms of model productions to meet your challenges in the next one to two years? Well, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we want to be on the same playing field as the lower 48. It almost seems to us in some ways that it's more of a political battleground than it is the National Weather Service. It, everything seems to happen here in the CONUS before it happens out in the El CONUS. So I'd kind of like to make sure that 
everything happens all at the same time. I realize when you really get down into these um, convective initiation um, models, you can't cover the whole globe at super high resolution, but there's got to be some way that things can be done that really helps um, meet our challenges and our requirements to get everything finished. Um, and we've got to make sure that we get you know, additional focus out there on the, the Western Pacific. Um, plans for working quite quickly to start getting more grids out over Micronesia and everything else out there, but we shouldn't really be the ones creating those kind of solutions or band-aids to get that taken care of. And then NWPS for Guam, the CMI, and American Samoa, you know, a lot of things get done for Hawaii, but not much out in those locations. And what do you envision for your models, products, needs um, to be in the longer term? Just like I mentioned, the higher resolution so that we can actually do some kind of validation and verification. Um, this map has been shown a lot, and this just kind of goes back to what I mentioned with the, the HER. <coughs> um, right now, it's not covering the Hawaiian Islands, so I'm assuming it's going to be some kind of a nest that gets built. I really don't know, but, and again, like I said, this doesn't have to be um, done right here because it's probably more something that can be just discussed with us offline, but I do want that done soon because I'm getting, getting beat up by my guys for quite some time um, on what's going on with that and why it's taken so long for us to be able to even get that over our um, um, over the Pacific region. Uh, I want to run through, I'm not going to really read all of this here because, again, I feel this is more um, solutions that we have um, had developed for us via PAC IOS uh, and the University of Hawaii to help meet our requirements. But I guess what I really want to kind of state here more uh, with this one and this here as well is, you know, for our requirements, how do we throw them over the transom to you folks so that um, we're not creating more and more solutions or if we do get some solutions that will actually meet requirements that will help fit us, exactly how is it that we package this up and get this to you folks so that we can indeed um, take care of those kind of requirements and stuff. And again, I'm not going to really run through all of this because um, this is here and, and Again, I think this is probably something that probably just needs to be done a little bit more off to the side rather than um, discussing all of this out right now. Um, and then um, I got to echo Andy's comments. You know, it's like if there's anybody that you know really has helped us out a great deal, it's been um, the NCO and with all of the IDP work and everything that's been done. Um, we've got a lot of great things that's been done there. But one of the last through miles um, is how do we actually get to, um, you know, where we can actually get everything into AWIPS too and all that. So I, I don't know how some of this is all going to work and if there's ways that um, someone can help me out with that later on or what have you, I'm more than happy to do that. And then if I can follow up on a question that I asked yesterday, you know, it's like uh, I'm not hearing that, you know, anything from the Himawari is getting into the model data, and I, I just don't quite understand that. Um, but you guys are a lot smarter than I am with when it comes to the modeling and all that, but I really would like to kind of understand a little bit more on where we're going with that. And then just to kind of wrap things up here and, and kind of finalize, I had some questions and stuff that I, or at least some also things that I feel are requirements or things that would really help us help you in both ways. Uh, we've been having uh, discussions on having INSET visit the Pacific region. This has been going on for two plus years now. I'd really like to see that as a high priority for uh, the Pacific region and not only that, I mean all of the regions because, um, you know, like I mentioned, I, I provided quite a few solutions there that we're getting via PAC IOS, but how do we turn these into requirements? And I think having INSEP come out and visit the Pacific region and be able to see what we're doing and why we're doing what it is that we're doing would really uh, benefit both sides to understanding what we need to be doing and how to do it properly. And, and again, like I said, there should be no political borders um, or so much conocentric work, uh, no region left behind. The HRR is a great example of this. This has been running on for quite some time now and we are finally, from what I'm hearing, we're going to finally be able to get that, and I really like that. Um, and I believe this has been discussed before, but 
uh, rather than additional folks um, from the field, why not do a true NWS, um, or I'm sorry, I kind of said that wrong. Uh, rather than bringing a bunch of SUs or other folks here to this meeting, why don't we actually bring, create an exchange program where we share people from here as well as the field so that um, you know, the true requirements and solutions and all, and all that uh, can uh, um, be ferreted out and everybody has a really good idea on how all of that um, works. And then my final comment, uh, <laughs> if there's one thing I learned this week, is don't go off the blue line. And by that I mean we used the iPhone map to uh, get here from the airport and we actually made a, a few mistakes uh, getting here in which we went off that blue line, but you gotta make a plan, stick to it, so that you don't get lost or you don't lose your way and you don't have to build solutions to dig, dig out of that. And I'll close out with that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, we certainly have time for questions, so we'll start with Glenn. Uh, you mentioned an exchange program. Um, one of the things, there's three working groups uh, on MEG. It's going to be set up with the SUS. Uh, and one of the things they will be looking at is a visitor's program. I don't know if you mean we're thinking like a few days to a week or two. You might be thinking of longer times. So, you know, I think people are going to try to set up a visitor's program where EMC people will travel out to places in the field and people from the field would come in to and set up. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, a week or two I think would actually be really great because, I mean, if bringing people here is all good and all, but, uh, but I think if you can actually figure out what people's niche is or what part of the model that they really need to have ferreted out and work into, that can actually be set up ahead of time so that that particular forecaster or suit can actually come back here and sit down with a group of people and exchange ideas on what really is important and how to ferret out requirements so that solutions are built. Very good. That was uh, Glenn White from EMC. Please continue to identify yourself for those. Uh, good morning, Peter Neely from the Weather Company. I want to follow up on the question I asked earlier this morning about access to the foreign models. I, um, I noticed you had a bullet there that said you used to have access to the ECMWF, but you don't anymore. I wonder if oh. you could, could uh, uh, color that comment. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's not, I, like some of the other folks here, I took comments directly from the field. And I just kind of left them un untouched. Like I mentioned, I didn't have a whole lot of time really to put everything together as well as I would like to. But no, we still can see the, EM, the European model data in our forecast, or I mean our AWEP system, but we're not allowed to put that into our grids anymore. That's the reasoning. And the obvious question is why? Yeah. Well. That's the agreement that we made with the Europeans. Is we can look at the data, but we cannot use it real time. Policy, yes. Agreement and policy. When the service has these things. So something at the higher levels to be uh, negotiated. Right. So. Are there are there any other questions, comments? Um, we want this to be an evolving discussion, um, but we'll certainly continue to have more time for that. Um, okay. Well, in the in interest of efficiency, we'll move on. And uh, our next presentation will be by Jeff Manikin on the model evaluation group here. So hopefully that will also spark some questions. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I want to first uh, acknowledge my uh, colleagues, uh, Glenn White and uh, Corey Guastini, uh, who are both uh, very dedicated to the uh, MEG mission and have uh, provided some of the uh, materials today. Um, with regards to the questions that were, uh, we, we asked uh, people to, uh, to answer, obviously the MEG are not true consumers of, of, the, uh, of the end step products production suite, but uh, in our in fact, that we're looking at the models 
every day. We, we feel like we have a, a pretty good handle on uh, a lot of the issues uh, that are faced. And with regards to the question about uh, is the amount of guidance uh, too much, too little, just right, I'm going to put it in the context of uh, among uh, the things that the MEG does is we, we do uh, full case studies uh, of big significant events. And one of those was the uh, New England uh, snowstorm, New York City pseudo bust of the last January. And uh, my next slide uh, shows the precip guidance that was available uh, just uh, before the snow was about to start. So we're looking at this from a, a recap perspective. This is the precip guidance available on uh, just uh, one day. Uh, we have our uh, four NAM cycles. We have our four NAM nest cycles, four GFS. Uh, two pairs of high-res windows, uh, the SREF means, the SREF probabilities. Uh, we just moved the fire weather nest uh, to that region. Those are available. Now we're getting into wrap range, and up oh, here come the herps. And the, the takeaway from this is if, if, if just reviewing an event uh, after it happens makes our heads spin, we can't fathom what it's like for the forecasters dealing with it in real time. And in that regard, we strongly support the idea of, of trying to simplify things. Now, that said, uh, we don't have great answers to that. Uh, in fact, we're going to do the uh, next few slides uh, on our assessment of, of some of the most pressing uh, model issues. And some of them will raise questions about whether uh, certain uh, models have been suggested to maybe uh, subsume the roles of other models or are really ready to do so. And the, one of our, the big issues we've noticed, and these are kind of taken from some of our uh, MEG uh, meetings uh, over the last year or so, uh, a big issue we feel is with the GFS uh, moisture, that there's really no attempt to match the uh, initial uh, two-meter dew points to OBS. And uh, sometimes the first guesses uh, with the moisture profiles are just so far off the observed ray OBS that there's the, uh, just no fit to the data. And here's an example. The, uh, the, observe, uh, the observations, the dew points here are, are on the right, and we have the uh, F00 from the NAM on top and the GFS uh, on, on the bottom. And uh, if you look there over uh, southeast Oklahoma and over far west Texas, uh, you can see that the, uh, the GFS is having a, a pretty hard time uh, handling the uh, initial uh, two meter dew point values. The, uh, Taking the scale down to minus 28 Fahrenheit doesn't even capture how far it, low it goes. And if you look at the uh, initial soundings from the NAM and GFS for Midland in this example, uh, I, my scale here of minus 40 for the GFS there in the low levels uh, didn't even capture things. So this is, again, not a long-range forecast. This is at the start of uh, the model uh, integration. A similar example here in, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast with the uh, observations color-coded on the right and the NAM and, and GFS. And you can see that the, the GFS is running too high uh, with the uh, dew points over a large area. And as a result, if you look at the uh, GFS uh, initial uh, fit to uh, data, this is the uh, ray off for Albany where the observed sounding is in the solid and the model is in the dash. And you can see there's... Uh, uh, no real abil uh, ability to fit the uh, low-level moisture profile here. With regards to inversion, the GFS does not make them strong enough. The NAM sometimes makes them too strong. Uh, whether it's a, it may be a chicken or egg thing, but the GFS makes low-level winds too strong. Is that what's causing? Is causing them to do the inversions not strong enough, or is that a byproduct of the physical processes going on? Not sure, but there's big implications for uh, forecasting precip type in, in warm advection events. Here are, uh, again, sample soundings in each case. These are, uh, these are six hour forecasts uh, for actually for Midland again, uh, where you have the uh, observed in solid and the dash is the model on top GFS, NAM bottom. And you can see on top there the, uh, the GFS is uh, off by uh, roughly. Uh, eight degrees Celsius there at the uh, low level in for six hour forecast, uh, too warm, and the NAND is actually overdoing the inversion where you end up being uh, roughly 3C or so uh, too warm. 
You might remember the uh, big uh, the, the Philadelphia uh, ice event uh, last January, uh, where a, a light uh, coating of ice in the uh, early morning uh, caused uh, major uh, accidents on overpasses and elevated surfaces, with many serious crashes and some fatalities. These are 12-hour forecast soundings for Philadelphia. NAM on top, GFS on the bottom. Again, the NAM captures the uh, strength of the inversion, has low levels below freezing. The GFS is uh, too, uh, does not capture the inversion properly and ends up with a sounding that's uh, noticeably too warm in the low levels and doesn't indicate a, uh, a threat uh, of ice. So, but before uh, I start getting accused of hugging the NAM uh, uh, too much, uh, a couple NAM issues that here. You know, the, the NAM has a low QPF bias in, in the warm sector, and it seems to be tied to uh, the model generating insufficient convection along the southern ends of the cold front, uh, away from the strong forcing, but in an area where you have good instability, convergence, deep moisture, that ends up generating good deep convection. And what happens in the uh, QPF then is because you don't generate enough precip in the warm sector, all that moisture uh, flows north into the cold sector and you end up with way too heavy precip uh, up in the, uh, in the cold sector. And we see that the NAM is often superior to the parent in this type of event, uh, suggesting that uh, issues with the convective scheme may be uh, what's at play. And here's an example with the uh, observed precip here uh, on, on the bottom and NAM and GFS on top. And uh, you can see that GFS in the upper right corner has uh, noticeably more precip in uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, and that's much lighter in, uh, in the NAM. And uh, as a result, you can see the NAM has noticeably heavier uh, precip up into uh, Iowa, Illinois, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, that area. Um, we actually had a summer student uh, look uh, into uh, this uh, issue uh, last year, I didn't find a lot of, of good answers. And that reminds me that I, I should make the point, as, I, as I'm pointing out these issues, I, I do have to note that uh, in response to the MEG raising these issues, uh, the, uh, the branches uh, have, have done a great job responding to these issues, and, and work is underway to uh, address most of them. Another issue is the, uh, the NAM, uh, especially the NEST, tends to allow instability to recover way too fast after active initial convection uh, stabilizes the atmosphere. We, we see it a lot in the NAM nest. We're not totally sure if this is a common occurrence in, uh, in high-res guidance. But here's an evolution of uh, surface-based CAPE uh, in the uh, southwest uh, earlier this year. And uh, you can see that the, uh, you can tell that there's been active convection here across uh, northern, uh, northwest Oklahoma, southwest Kansas. The case has been reduced uh, all the way down into the uh, couple hundred uh, range. Here's six hours later, and you can just see some very rapid recovery in that area, and another three hours, so it's uh, 18, 21, 0 Z. And you can see that you've gone from uh, essentially no case up to roughly 5,000 in six hours right after you've had uh, convection that uh, has stabilized things. This is what the analysis, the uh, observed uh, look like. And this is a day and a half forecast, so that obviously you didn't get the evolution right. The larger pattern is wrong. But again, the point is, it's too easy for the model to generate convection uh, and then immediately uh, destabilize things within a few hours that creates a potential environment, according to the model, for more convection uh, to be generated. Uh, we've heard, uh, a number of people have raised the issue with the warm, dry biases in the RAP uh, uh, and the HER and the GFS. The good news is that the, uh, the upcoming uh, RAP V2 and HER, I had that back, sorry, it's RAP V3, HER V2, sorry for the typos there, will significantly uh, mitigate these biases. And the next version of the GFS uh, also shows uh, some, uh, some healthy uh, improvement. Here's a uh, uh, nice example uh, of that. These are um, NAM and GFS 12-hour forecasts of surface space CAPE with the uh, observations on the right. And the uh, deficiency in the GFS is, uh, is, is quite clear. And here's the RAP and the HER showing uh, similar problems. 
The good news is there's some parallel testing. Here's the uh, wrap on top, the parallel wrap on top, and the parallel her on the bottom. And uh, feel really good that the uh, next uh, versions of the wrap uh, and the her uh, uh, really mitigate this uh, issue uh, quite nicely. And then uh, these are uh, some stats from the GFS. Uh, a verification of a surface, a two meter temperature on top, two meter dew point on the bottom. In each case, the uh, uh, observed uh, an average over a number of stations, observed is black, the operational GFS is red, and the parallel is in green. Uh, you can see some improvement uh, in the temperatures here on top. Uh, there's bigger improvements on the bottom here, the uh, difference between the red to the green. Uh, at the, during the afternoon, the evening hours is noticeable, uh, but there is still a, a, a pretty uh, a, a good way to go in terms of uh, fully uh, mitigating that bias. Uh, the, uh, the global group is, uh, is working uh, uh, quite hard uh, on that. Another issue, and you know, there's been talk about, you know, do we want to consolidate ensembles? One issue that we continually note in the MEG is that there are cases in which certain deterministic models uh, lock into a particular solution before the guess does. And the potential reason is that the ensemble is just not generating sufficient spread and is sometimes just too lockstep in with the GFS. This is the, uh, the big Thanksgiving storm from last year. Uh, Huge uh, travel, potential travel impact on the uh, I-95 corridor. Again, you can see there was a, a large area of uh, heavy rain and some interior snows uh, here uh, the uh, day before Thanksgiving. At 132 hours, the, uh, here's the European uh, model, which is at this point locked in on the idea that there will be heavy precip all through the 95 corridor and points inland. The uh, GFS is uh, still keeping the storm out to sea. It's trending northwest, but it still uh, has only a very light event for the 95 corridor and nothing inland. The guess here, uh, probability of a half inch of, of precip during that time is only in the uh, 10 to 30% range while the 95 corridor less inland. Again, the point is that the deterministic GF, uh, or European model has caught on and the GEFS ensemble has not. Here's another uh, example. Um, this is a, uh, uh, about a couple weeks later, last December, uh, observed deep trough here in the east. And we're looking at 120 hours. This is the uh, European ensemble with the uh, mean here in red. And you can see the mean has a, a, a deep trough, not deep enough, but a number of the members uh, do show that a, uh, a stronger trough here in the east is, uh, is a possibility. Here's the same depth. The mean is noticeably less amplified, and very few members uh, show the potential for a, a deep uh, east coast uh, trough. And you'll notice that this is the operational GFS at that time. Many of the guest members look just like the GFS. And again, so the issue is, you know, can the guest generate sufficient uh, spread? We think uh, a little more work on that uh, needs to be done, although it's, it's certainly uh, underway. An issue we've just caught on to recently is uh, the bimodal, bimodal clustering in the SHREP, which actually used to be trimodal. Uh, now we have the uh, two cores. But uh, this is a, a case from just a, a few weeks ago. This was the, uh, the system that brought the uh, big tornado outbreak into the uh, western plains. And you can see at this time uh, we have a uh, uh, sub-540 uh, Closed the contour here at the 500 millibar level, deep, uh, somewhat negative uh, tilt trough uh, in that region. This is, uh, thank you. This is, uh, I picked seven of the 13 uh, ARW members. The, they are, this is very representative of the full 13. This is a 69 hour uh, SHREF forecast, just the ARW members, the 500 millibar height. And again, you'll see. And all of the ARW members here have that uh, negative tilt. And there, there is some spread, which is good. You've, uh, the position of the uh, closed contour, the intensity, there's some variation. The general theme here is uh, strong, uh, very amplified uh, negative tilt trough. 
these are seven uh, uh, representative members of the NMMB, where you have a much different uh, idea of what's going on. They're, they're all slower, and they're all pretty much open weight, no real hint of the uh, negative tilt trough. And again, pretty uh, clear to see there. And again, that, that kind of bimodal clustering uh, is, is really not uh, what you want to see uh, out of, uh, the, out of a, a well-developed ensemble. So a couple of our thoughts on the uh, future needs, uh, on where we think uh, things need to go, uh, and how we think uh, the production suite can evolve in the, in the years ahead. And we, we strongly support the push to get a high-resolution ensemble into production in 2017. We also think that the uh, issue of, of single core versus dual core uh, needs time to be figured out. And uh, we, we, uh, we, it, there's insufficient evidence at this point to really make a, a full determination there. And as resources uh, uh, permit, it's pretty clear that uh, we need to, uh, with that high-res ensemble, eventually has to, uh, uh, the data assimilation has to be a convection permitting and, and a, an ensemble of data assimilation, which is very costly, it won't happen overnight. But events like the Long Island flooding last year, where we saw that just uh, Assimilating the radar, radar reflectivity wasn't uh, uh, able to do a whole lot. That shows that uh, some of these, these real tough events are, are going to need that really costly data assimilation. Now one of the uh, UCACN recommendations is uh, to have the GFS potentially take over the NAM duties. And we certainly don't argue the idea that the GFS has synoptic superiority, uh, particularly at longer time ranges. However, the NAM does uh, handle certain short-range elements, particularly related to uh, uh, moisture and temperature profiles, especially in the PBL, better. And uh, we're, we're not sure that the uh, GFS is ready to completely take over uh, those duties in the short range. Another thing is we, we think that uh, having the GFS and GEFs uh, uh, updated, uh, staggered, uh, is not the best idea. You know, we, uh, this past year, we found uh, some, some big issues in the GFS, and those are, to some extent, being addressed in the GFS upgrade, which is coming this spring. But we just introduced those then into the last GEPS implementation. And while it's certainly not trivial to try and uh, run and evaluate parallels for both at the same time, uh, we think in the long range, range, if there's a way that they can both be uh, upgraded at the same time, uh, it makes sense. And again, our uh, Last slide here is our, uh, our shameless self-promotion. Uh, we have our meetings uh, each Thursday at 11.30 uh, Eastern. Our uh, apologies to our customers uh, in the uh, way out to the west. Uh, we have webinar access, and I, I need to thank uh, uh, Greg Patrick's uh, group, uh, including especially Jack Settlemeyer, uh, for um, record, uh, you know, letting us use their webinar and uh, saving all the productions on uh, Google Drive. and. Uh, Please contact Mary Hart if you do not already get the MEG announcements to know what we're going to cover each week. And uh, just a final comment. We've seen a lot of uh, presentations here uh, address uh, some really interesting issues, uh, challenges in local, um, within WFOs, within regions. We welcome your presentations on those in the MEG, whether they're shorter or longer. We would love to have you and we invite you to uh, present some of these topics to uh, introduce them to uh, what's a, a pretty good audience uh, every week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jeff. We have some time for some questions. Um, certainly the, the MEG is looking at a broad uh, range of issues. So let's start back here. we got Stan, too. Is that a stretch? No, that's no, a question. Jeff Craven. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so, a quick roll call. I, something I, I don't even see an agenda or anything, so I guess I'll let you guys run it. But you're going to listen to what's that's going on. Me, but, uh, you're uh, in Kansas City. Yeah. Um, if you're online, please Anybody mute uh, unless you want to ask a question. Thank you. Dave? What down in Norman? Yeah, we have Ed, Dale, um, Stas, Eric, and Mike here. Okay. 
Hey, Mike hey, here. Mike. You're on our line. Okay. Yeah, here. Yeah, so, uh, so hey, I, Brian's here. My question first. Ross is here. And Tony. And Rick. And Rick. Ross, we got everybody. Uh, anybody else? So it's Silver Spring? Uh, okay, uh, those people that are on the anybody line right now, um, are you part of the people calling in for the production that suite review? Started. I don't have an agenda or anything, so I don't know where we're going. Okay. Yeah, John, uh, I do have some stuff prepared for today. You do? Uh, I had an action item to get with the, the AWIPS group and put together a preliminary analysis of the courses that, that Jeff had provided. Uh, let, farming and let, let me... Uh, that I... I'll go ahead and kill it and then bring it back up. Maybe that'll knock them off. Sounds like it's WDTV. It is. It's a, it's a training call, and Ogren's running it right now. So I can just give you all the, the meetings. Chat at him. This is Joshua Shack. There's a joint ID in the AWIP training call calendar entry. I asked. Hello. Uh, this is NCEP. Can you hear us on the line? If you go into the dial information, the phone number. NWTC. Over. Okay. Uh, I can, when I save it on my version of the AWIT training team call. Hey, this is, uh, this is Bob in, uh, in Boulder. I can probably get him off the phone if I walk in the other room. That's great. Thank you. 341373. Nine four one. Yeah, Mary. Mary um, apologies to those people in line. We're going to turn you off for a second so we can have, or turn it down quite a bit so we can let Jeff ask his question. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back on as soon as we can. Okay. Yeah. So, and this actually, someone texted me and wanted me to ask this question, so I'm just going to. Uh, but I, it is an interesting question. No, I don't expect you to answer it now, but it's something I think the Meg group would help us with. Is the there's some perceptions about what the NMMB core and the ARW core are capable of doing in terms of storm. Hello, uh, Mike. Mode and, and yeah, apparently when you dialed in, uh, it somehow tapped into. Uh, Yes, a annual review uh, call, and they say they're hearing your voice coming through on their line. Yeah, we can. Cam Ensemble, and Meg Group, you, could uh, talk so about it, because it's, and it's also not just about tornadoes and supercells. It's how does it handle... Are you using a second line? ...and winter weather, but it's, so it's more of a comment than a question. Sure, I, I oh. will say we have made some attempts... Let's, uh, well, a good idea. How about we just hang up and reconnect on, on this yeah, number again? The, uh, the big okay, John. That went across East Texas uh, last May. And these were 15-hour uh, forecast. The observed bow echo over Louisiana is on the right. I have 15-hour forecast here from the uh, her, the Nestle Wharf, the NMMB high-res window, and the ARW high-res window. And uh, you can see the the high-res window um, failed to uh, to keep the, the system going. What we found was there was Spurious convection out ahead of the main line a couple hours earlier that seemed to disrupt the inflow. That said, we, we have seen some other events uh, with heavy rainfall that the NMNB has done very well on, better than the ARW. So I agree, it's, it's an incredibly uh, relevant and important issue, and we will continue to look at it. I just want to add to that that we are, between all the different groups, in absolute 100% full agreement that we want to go to a, to a single core ensemble. The, the, the thing that we want to see the proof of is whether or not in the short term it makes sense to use existing models in that ensemble, not trying to add a new one, use already existing operational models. If, if we would be talking about <coughs> bringing in a second model that was not already completely running in operations and fed it, it would not be a question. It's really I know it, it doesn't always show up in the discussion. Well, it's, it's not a discussion of where we want to go. It's a discussion about what we do in the meantime and what is the best best uh, bang for the buck. And, and the Mac can help. <coughs> excuse me. The Mac can help us out there to make this a evidence 
driven decision. And so um, that, that, uh, that, that should not only be the Mac, it should be everybody involved. The one other thing I wanted to add about uh, <coughs> the comment about uh, the GFS um, uh, being able to, uh, to uh, replace some of the duties of the NAM, that's not, not necessarily always the right question. The right question is, if we have these models at the same resolutions, and <coughs> they, 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 they create similar products, what do we need to do to make sure that we don't need them? So the better question is, what do we need to do in terms of improving the physics of the GFS so it could become feasible in the future? So Jeff's remark is, right now, no, but it also gives you the answer of what do we need to do, what should be our highest science priority to make it work? Okay, um, Stan had a question, and then I see you back. Uh, just a quick question, I guess, on the GFS. Esrel was considering doing an experiment for VJ, if John is here, uh, to add the surface data, kind of following the same uh, GSI parameters used in RAP with GDAS. Is someone already doing that at your end, VJ, to try to actually show that to draw for temperature dew point observations in the GFS initial conditions? Is that already being done at your end? Okay, we'd love to work with you on that. Okay. Um, Jeff McQueen. Steve, we haven't heard from you this morning, so good. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, good that you're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get in there before Steve did. I'm, but, yeah, my question was related to the UMAC committee report and how you may be able to help that. You've, you've already talked about how you're helping the UMAC uh, committee report with the Meg and the Shref. And also, they, they also recommend Chapter 2, uh, first section there, to allow NSEP to more effectively partner with the research community. The UMAC recommends that NSEP should transition from its current in-house NMMB core to a community core, such as the ARW. And uh, I think the MEG, they're, 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 they're uh, recommending it based on more uh, pragmatic issues to work with, it, work with NSSL better, work with the research community better. But Meg could also tell us from a scientific perspective, it doesn't make sense, because you, you have core comparisons in the SHREF, you've got core comparison in the HRW, right, friends? And you also have core comparisons, so, so that it's not like apples and oranges like you got up there, and you also have core comparisons in a way between the HER for the first 15, 15 hours in the NMMB. So I'm just make that recommendation, I don't know, uh, it, and I see that you're starting to do that, but I think that would really address their single core recommendation that I see like in five or six places in, in the report. We, we are starting to do that, and again, with these STI teams uh, that are being formed, one of them, uh, their specific goal is to uh, help figure out how to go forward with developing a, a high-res ensemble, and uh, experiments at HWT this spring will look at the issue of core, and that will no doubt be a, a big area of focus going forward. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Okay, now Steve. You do want I'm not Steve, I'm anonymous. <laughs> uh, Jeff, um, on the bimodal distribution of the clustering uh, in the ensemble, that's nothing new. Um, you saw that actually in the global models in Joaquin, in the ensembles, GFS going more <laughs> inland, and ensemble from the European Center going further east. The question is, is there any systematic difference in the performance of each individual ensemble? Yes. And if so, can it be explained? And in particular, let me be more specific and ask the question, are the boundary conditions for each of the members in the ARW and the NMD the same or are they different from different sources? The, the initial and boundary conditions are now mixed across members. We have, we, we actually we did a, a full MEG presentation. Sorry? From which model the boundary sorry, Across the two cores of the SHREF. There's, there's an NMMB core and an ARW. There's 13 members of each, and the initial and boundary conditions are mixed and matched uh, across. Boundary conditions has to be from a global model. Presumably. Well, some it's GFS, some GEFs, I, I, I members, I believe. What? That's right, mostly different members of the guests. 
So we did a, uh, we looked into this issue, uh, presented it uh, a few weeks ago at the MEG, and we actually found a couple of instances here where these troughs were noticeably slower in all of the uh, NMMB members. So there, we think there's something systematic going on there because it, it actually seems to be a little bit slower and, and weaker than what the uh, operational NAM does, which also uses an NMMB core. So we think that the NMMB core of the SHREF is behaving a little bit differently than the NAM, and we didn't expect that big a difference. So uh, Jundu has actually been running some experiments to try and figure out what's going on there, because we think there is something systematic. This isn't random. We think there's something systematic going on that can lead to uh, improvement. How much difference is in the resolution between the NAM and the NMB, NM, NB, whatever you call it? 13 versus, or sorry, it's 12 versus 16. Agreed. Vertical levels, there's a few more in the NAM, but we, we don't know the answers yet. Um, one of the things I was going to say, to the extent that each model sometimes wins, sometimes loses, so it's basically a draw. When you see a bifurcation, essentially you're seeing the uncertainty in the uncertainty, which of itself is useful information, potentially. Understand. Potentially. Understand. Uh, we, just, you know, we, we seem to, have, 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 we, we think we see a systematic bias here. It's something that we're looking into uh, further, and uh, I'll be happy to share that uh, Meg presentation with you if you're interested. Okay. All right. Um, we're, oh, one more thing by Steve, and then, we are, then we're going to move on. I, I want to support Jeff's shameless plug for the MAG. I think it's been going for a little over three years now, went through some growing pains. It, it's, it's become, I think, transformational in terms of what's taking place within EMC, how it now extends out to the field and the user community who can dial in each week. I, I certainly want to thank Jeff, Glenn, uh, and Corey more recently for the type of work that they've been doing because this was something that wasn't happening at, at least outside of EMC, uh, folks were aware of. And it is really a huge step forward, I think, in what's taking place uh, within EMC and the communication with the user community. And uh, if anything, if it's possible to uh, I think it's going to be helpful to have more Sioux participation, but within EMC itself, uh, it'd be great if we could uh, grow the team, if at all possible, because it's, it's a ton of work. And that's great. The other thing I did want to say is, is uh, regarding the different cores for potential convection allowing ensembles, as I alluded to yesterday, at the HWT this next spring, we're working with different members of the uh, convection allowing scale community, including GSD, NCAR, CAPS, NSSL is playing a big role to draw, try and do some, some very systematic uh, testing of the ARW and NMMB cores and how they might influence what would be an appropriate configuration for a convection allowing ensemble. Thank you, Steve. I hope our check's clear. Yeah. Bill, did you want anything further? Okay. Right. First of all, we drag, we, we are, uh, we're recognizing that this work is, uh, is not just uh, uh, for the few people that are doing it right now. It should be an integral part of all the branches and all the groups that we're working with. So, so we're repurposing some folks internally to not only look at it in their own little room, but actually look at it in, inside the MAG site. <clears throat> and we're also looking at, at, uh, at uh, making sure that we have uh, uh, these uh, uh, people uh, not part-time on it, but full-time on it, and, and uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the overall budget, uh, see if we can get some, uh, some more people in there. But, but specifically, the, uh, being able to drag in people from the branches that are already validation work and specifically focus on, on doing this outside looking instead of inside looking is the low-hanging fruit. And, uh, and, and getting these people uh, the recognition for how important the work is that they can do this full-time. Okay, one final comment. Glenn. Um, and that's, there are three MEG uh, working groups sort of set up to help to improve, to bring the field more into the process. 
and also we have to revamp our implementation process. Um, so we want you involved from the get-go. Uh, our hidden agenda is you realize how difficult our work is. Um, a guy is just when we go out to the field, we hope to send the EMC people out to you. You can show us how difficult your work is. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, we're going to, well, sort of shift gears with this Ask the Branch Chief. So I'll ask Jeff and Bob um, and Vijay to come on up. Um, we've eaten a bit into our time. Um, however, the same flavor of questions I, I, I think would probably emerge. So this is just a, a, a chance at some more extended discussion. So um, no casting any rotten fruit their way or anything. <laughs> They're the messengers. But um, uh, let's see. Jeff, J <laughs> uh, Jeff Manikin assembled what we had uh, uh, online last night. Thank you very much for everyone that did said, submit some questions or a question. Um, we had quite a few questions from a person named an anonymous. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll cover those, and then what we'll do is we'll move to questions from the floor. So uh, anyway, this is a time for some, uh, some extended discussion. So we're still going to try to break uh, according to the schedule. Um, so we'll just get started. Let's see. Jeff, do you want to, do you want to be the one to read the questions? Okay, I'll read the questions. Okay, so, oh, VJ has a clicker. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll uh, go ahead and let you have a, actually, you know, we could just let you sit down and we can move this. Oh, that's fine. I've been sitting, been sitting all morning. Oh, true. Okay, well, you stand, sit, whatever works. Okay, so the first question is for me, I think it's on the regional hurricane models, how they fit into the next generation uh, global modeling system. I think I illustrated the plan uh, in my uh, presentation yesterday for the hurricanes. Eventually, the global model, uh, one of the conditions for the NGGPS is to have the capability to produce variable resolution grids that uh, essentially uh, repurpose the global models to provide the high resolution guidance where it is required. So uh, one of the conditions uh, for both the I codes that are being tested right now are to uh, evaluate those capabilities. Uh, we know MPAS has a static uh, mesh refinement technique and uh, the GFDL finite volume model has uh, already built in high resolution nesting capability. So these will be uh, developed into uh, the current existing technology that is providing high resolution guidance for hurricanes. So this is a transition plan and I think by 2020 time frame, uh, the regional models with a hurricane nest can, in principle, be absorbed by the global models uh, so that it, it provides continuous uh, high resolution guidance for these hurricanes. Um, it's, it's an engineering challenge. It's uh, also a challenge because it should be done in a coupled sense. So uh, stay tuned. I think you'll be hearing more on how we transition our regional models into the global. If the, if the nets are sufficiently large, yes. Can you go to the, can you go to the next one? Yeah, good. Well, well, we'll come back to that. We just want to make sure we can uh, get these. So this is uh, one for Jeff Domago. Well, um, it's also related to the hurricane. And we're working with the uh, microphone. Oh, Jeff, Jeff. Uh, just for those of you that are on the phone, we do have people back on the phone, I hope. Uh, I'll just read the question. Over the long term, is it possible to integrate the magnitude of SPC models for convection into the realm of mesoscale prediction of the inner core of a hurricane? From uh, yeah, from NM, right, NHC question. Well it's, well, it's phrased as the multitude of SPC models. I, I will interpret that as the multitude of microphysics schemes that you can run in a mesoscale or convection allowing scale model. Uh, and, and those are being worked on. The and I would assume that they are candidates for the inner core for the hurricane application. Um, they, of course, have to be tested, and that involves a lot of resources. And uh, I, I think the, the HWARF currently runs with the Farrier Oligo scheme. Maybe it's just the Farrier without the Oligo uh, things. And, and that has shown a fair amount of success. 
Uh, testing is being done with Thompson. I believe BJ is the one who knows more about that than, than I do. But I, w I would say the, the answer is yes. Uh, physics options will be investigated for the intercore. So well, I, can, I can compliment that. Uh, one of the ideas is to develop this 10-member Hedgehog ensemble system uh, in the next uh, three years time frame, and that includes a variation in the physics that comes from the microphysics for the inner core. We do have uh, explicit microphysics right now at two kilometer resolution. So the answer is similar to what uh, the high resolution convective allowing ensembles do for convection. Uh, the same or similar techniques will be applied initially for H4 and eventually for the next generation system. All right, thanks. Um, now we can come back and have some more general discussion on these. We just want to make sure we get through the ones uh, that that, uh, that came in over the um, over the web. So one for Bob. If you want to read the question. So, yeah, for the uh, people on the phone, Mary just brought it back up. Um, so anonymous, who of course is also the author of many a great quote. Um, we have heard uh, Mesoscale Branch plans to add high-res ensembles to the production suite. Uh, do you envision some of your high-res systems evolving to use this input as background forcing? And uh, the answer is yes, we're already doing so in terms of uh, resolution. The uh, uh, Great Lakes Wave model uses the NDFD winds at the two and a half kilometers now. If uh, the winds are provided at higher resolution, and uh, there, there's a there's scientific merit to it. Then we'll use those. The near shore wave prediction system is using the GFE winds. So again, whatever resolution uh, we we have, uh, we'll be using the ensembles. Uh, on, speaking ensemble specific, right now the on, our ensemble system is only the uh, global. And at global scale, uh, we don't have, you know, it, it's not making sense globally to do, nine, you know, 95% of the world at half degree resolution and then change, have a, a wall at the, somewhere and then pick up higher resolution um, uh, from, from the wind forcing and the, the inconsistencies. But the, uh, uh, certainly as, Forcing is available, uh, and there's good reason for it. We'll use it. Okay, very good. Could you? Oh, you go to the next one. Great. So, <clears throat> so I got this question from the same anonymous, a uh, different anonymous. <laughs> All right. The question is: uh, So, are there really going to be no CFS upgrades until 2022? Seems like uh, a long time to be using only the version two. Well, the version two is being upgraded to, so that the maintenance of that um, is taken care of for the next five years. And I think Suru has shown uh, the timeline that's only a representative timeline. Everything depends on how quickly we evolve into the unified global modeling system under the uh, NGGPS or the unified global coupled system that's being uh, uh, prototyped right now. And uh, Suru has shown the plans for the couple data simulation, and uh, eventually, I think uh, once we reach there, how quickly we can reach that stage. From then onwards, there will be a more regular, uh, possible upgrade for the climate system, as uh, Hendrik mentioned in his talk. It's every four years instead of waiting for this long. So I think uh, one of the constraints right now is the transition from uh, the independent models into a unified coupled system that's being developed. So I think uh, this is uh, going to slow down a little bit. Uh, 2022 is not set in stone. It could be much earlier than that if everything is done quick and and careful. So the answer is uh, for now uh, we have to live with that. But once we get the unified global system up and running, uh, the implementation process can be much more streamlined with uh, more regular upgrades rather than waiting for this long. Thanks. Um, okay, next one. All right, this is similar line. Uh, 
I, I embrace a multi-model ensemble approach, and part of that uh, involves the dual course and running the. the oh, sorry, I didn't read the question. The question is, we are, it's somewhat rhetorical, I think, by the author. We already have the wrap. Why do we need the the NMRR? The NMRR is an hourly updated system used for the NMB, whereas the wrap is the an hourly updated system for the ARW in the wrap, and it also feeds the HER. The NMRR also feeds nests for CONUS and Alaska. So the, the idea is to establish the baseline for the dual core ensemble for both convection allowing and the larger domain uh, SHREF. Now, again, there's been discussion about whether the larger domain SHREF would, be, would persist, uh, and I think it, eventually it will be replaced by a global system, as will the NAM and the RAF, uh, since they're large domain and... Uh, of comparable resolution to the current GFS. But in the meantime, for support of the nest to improve the quality of the nest, to improve the quality of the NAM, the hourly updating in the NAM RR, uh, we're looking to see that benefit coming from that. Okay. All right. So the next question is about uh, why uh, Himawari data is uh, not used in the GFS initialization seems like an enormous amount of data not to use. So I requested John to provide me the answer so I can relay that. Uh, there are two issues here. One is uh, the Himawari data is uh, coming in two parts, the satellite winds and the radiances. And uh, JMA provides the satellite winds from the empty sat, which is supposed to be turning down, uh, shutting down in March 2016. So we have been testing the uh, impact of uh, sat winds from Himawari already, so that uh, as that switch happens, we will quickly migrate into that. The major issue is with the radiance data. It's not uh, um, done in a, in a proper way that such that the ends up uh, operations could keep up with the real-time data flow. Uh, it's uh, highly voluminous. So th those issues are being worked out, and also, uh, we have to depend on Nesdis star rather than Nesdis operations for the uh, real-time operational support. So the bottom line is uh, it's expected to be included in the next implementation, which is supposed to be in 2017. The radiance. The satellite winds will be in. The radiance data is not going to be in in the next implementation. The wind, but the winds, you say? The winds are going to be. Okay by next implementation. Or when, when the empty fat is turned down, we'll be switching to, uh, well, I thought it's March 2016. So they're still being received. The plan is So the plan is then that the winds will go in in March of 2016. Absolutely that. Okay. Okay. Um, could you? There we go. Back to Jeff. A lot to read. I'll let you go through it. I'm Jeff Craven. Um, since I'm not a modeler, I ask for patience on this question. I ask for your patience on this question. Oh, that's a repeat. Sorry. If you want to run a three-kilometer NAM nest, you have to have a 12-kilometer NAM parent. In other words, could you run the three-kilometer NAM nest with wrap 13-kilometer initial conditions or 13-kilometer GFS boundary conditions? Uh, just wondering if there are creative ways to conserve CPU on W cost and get members into the HREF. And the answer is yes, and ultimately we will I'm almost certainly be doing that. But in the initial implementation of HREF, you know, we, we have a system that's built around the nest running inside of the NAM, so there are boundary conditions that are updated every uh, couple of times a minute. Um, we really, we don't have the resources to, to do the extensive testing of pulling those out and running with just the, the global or the wrap boundary conditions and initial conditions. But hopefully we will be able to do that for a future HREF implementation. And, and again, take advantage of any savings the parent domain runs both the RAP versus the HER and the NAM versus the NAM nest is a relatively small expense. 
And the, given the benefits that you get from having hourly updated boundary conditions for the wrap versus the her, and the internal boundary conditions for the NAM and the NAM nest, it's a small price to pay initially uh, for that stability. Okay. Three uh, part question or three people to answer it. So, so this, is a, this is a general question. I'll read it and let Bob answer it. <laughs> very, very good. We have heard many calls to simplify the production speed. How do you feel your branch can contribute to this simplification? So an opportunity for each. So well, I guess I turn back to the uh, comment I made yesterday about our coupled systems, and three of the six are in my branch. So uh, part of it is just that, the coupling of the systems so that uh, we don't have to have multiple independent uh, supports for, uh, at the moment, uh, for instance, five wave models, although actually the structure is such that it's not five different wave models, and you know, it's been well designed that way. But nevertheless, uh, coupling will uh, um, migrate that so that uh, w we can use uh, the same or uh, transparently modify scale-aware uh, kinds of models uh, to work with the uh, mesoscale hurricane app and uh, gl global models. So, uh, so that's one way. A second, um, if not simplification, coordination uh, it comes from uh, the fact that we've been sharing out uh, expertise regarding sea surface temperature, lake surface temperature, ice cover, so that uh, there's a degree of consistent understanding across all the branches as to how these things uh, uh, behave. And uh, it does simplify life if you all understand similar things. And I'll put in the plug for the land surface group who's doing the same uh, kind of thing of uh, sharing knowledge across all of the systems from their uh, from their spot as the central point. Thank you, Bob. Um, BJ, Jeff. Well, I I talked about the HRF SRF system being a consolidation of uh, RAP and HER and NAM and NAM Nest and high res window and get rid of the dejects. So it'll remove some of the moving parts and it'll create a large implementation for the superwoman known as Becky Cosgrove and her group. Um, put words into Andy's mouth there. Um, so in, in terms of the moving number of moving parts, it doesn't decrease all that much, but the idea that it would be done in one uh, large coordinated implementation I think will simplify things. And, especially in terms of our scheduling of implementation, which is one of the aspects of the new evaluation process uh, that, that has been proposed, is, is not only are we going to move the science evaluation to prior to the 30-day, the final 30-day IT test, we're going to do a attempt to do a scheduled set of implementations uh, and stay to those schedules. Uh, right now, uh, implement, there's a lot of implementation and a lot of them slip and then keep slipping. So we need to get more disciplined about that. So I think from the global point of view, uh, as you my colleague notified in their uh, review yesterday, NGGPS is providing the path for unification for both uh, uh, all the three global systems, the global deterministic forecast, the ensemble system, and the climate forecast in a unified couple system. So I think uh, we are making good progress in the direction. Uh, the NAMS uh, ESMF-based uh, NOAA environmental modeling system will provide the basis. We already uh, started making plans on unifying the physics uh, for all these uh, applications that include the scale-aware component and also the coupled uh, AC wave ice land interactions. So uh, that eventually will simplify and bring, bringing the data simulation component into that and also absorbing some of the uh, products that we are generating into the global system will lead to make it much more simple, although, as people noted, each implementation will be much more tougher because of all the 
connections and uh, uh, links that we have to worry about. So that's that's new experience for all of us here. So hopefully we'll, we'll get better at, at all these uh, aspects of it. Uh, thanks, VJ. Here we go. Well, back to you. Sure. So, so uh, this question is for me on the uh, week two forecast. MJ forecast for week two and beyond have fallen behind ECNWF and other centers. Surprisingly, I don't even see the skill of forecasting the MJO being discussed in the CFS guest update. What steps are being taken to improve those forecasts? Uh, I have to take a step back here. I don't know whether this is uh, vetted uh, or is it just an educational guess uh, on uh, we are falling behind the European Center because I have not seen myself uh, any such evaluation. But certainly there was a significant uh, increase in the skill uh, of MJO from CFS V1 to V2, it was well documented by Suru and uh, several others in the recent publication. So I think, um, uh, and as part of uh, the gap, yes, we have not looked into it. Uh, it, it was not uh, a, a standard metric for the uh, implementation. So yeah, uh, th this requires a lot more effort in terms of improving the MJO skill, and it requires a longer term reanalysis or reforecast data sets to really uh, assess uh, whether we are making progress or not. So that's, uh, uh, that's on our uh, table right now to improve the physics, and especially in the coupled world, because the tropical convection is essentially a coupled phenomenon. And that uh, will be the primary science-driven goal for the next CFS V3. But I think um, uh, we need to really carefully look into what the basis of uh, the statement is, and, and if it is true, we need to really diagnose and use that information. It's not easy to improve the scale of MJO by any center anywhere in the world, so it has to be carefully tested, evaluated, and, and then suggested for implementation. Couple settings. So, um, you want to jump to the next one, or is that? Oh, here we go. Say what? We'll let Jeff start. Yes, I think. Well, it's for me. Uh, from Jeff Craven again, and I will be patient. Uh, I would like to know the relative cost of running 15-hour run of the HER each hour versus the cost of running CFS out to 45 days every six hours. I think it would be very enlightening for stakeholders like the SUS to know how much CPU it costs to run each model in our suite. Um, I was going to bring up the uh, infamous jigsaw puzzle but well, I couldn't figure out how to do it over coffee break. Um, in a rough manner of speaking, the, the HER takes about 85 nodes for essentially most of the day. Uh, since it's an hourly system and it uses most of that hour, uh, there's ups and downs, but that's roughly 85. Uh, and I believe the CFS is similarly using a solid stripe of processing for various pieces of their suite. Uh, part of it is doing the 45 days, another part is doing 90 days, but it's strung out in, in, or, in a way to fill up a stripe of processing, and I believe that's on the order of 40 nodes. 128 nodes? Oh, 128 tasks. That's the high watermark? Okay, so that would be less than 40. Like eight nodes, eight nodes uh, throughout the day. Eight. Okay, so eight versus 85. So the different members run staggered using eight nodes every six hours throughout the day, and her uses about 80 nodes, uh, uh, taking up the same stripe uh, across the whole, whole machine throughout the day. The difference. About, stripe, but it's a yeah, it's a stripe. Okay. It's, uh, Uh, okay. Sometimes more resources are used right now in terms of expense. For, for the HER? Yeah, for the HER. For the HER, okay. So that uh, other, other system, other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle don't cover a stripe of processing, so it's not as easy to make that comparison as, as you pose the question that it is a, one stripe versus another. Very good. The, the HER and the... So it's about an order of magnitude difference. And in yeah. terms of the NAMRR, we ex would ex 
expect to use uh, about the same as the her for the nest. Uh, the, but we also figure we can cover not only CONUS, but also Alaska with that same set of profits. OK. Um, the floor is open. OK, I'm going to go to Stan first, because uh, I, I, I wasn't sure how much time we'd take. But he, uh, he definitely um, has some questions or comments, um, input. Could you go back to, was it, the, it was the first question, I think. Oh, uh, go uh, as the first one. Keep going. One more. That's it. There you go. Just a quick comment regarding this question about stochastic physics. So, uh, uh, under DTC auspices, Isadora Yankov now has been able to demonstrate that with stochastic versions of the HER physics, we can actually match spread uh, for uh, what we get from the multi physics approach for the ensemble. And I think that's a really important point. Uh, you know, toward moving toward this simplification that we're looking for overall. And I thought that was relevant about this. This includes the Thompson microphysics, for instance, to have stochastic uh, versions of that, to be able to start to produce this and, and to be able to take advantage of making the single best set of physics, especially for mesoscale, do stochastic versions of that for ensemble spread. So it's a, it's a comment here on that, Jeff, maybe in the context of what could be done there. Uh, and to, right. No, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I think I had indicated to a uh, question from yesterday that I would foresee the stochastic approach and a set of common physics being in our future. It's just a matter of how soon, because we have to do so much testing to validate that you know, a technique is, is, um, is better and it doesn't have unintended consequences, which is something we tend to be more interested in and more worried about than the average Joe or Joe. Right. Or Joe. And I think more can be said about what constitutes ready, but I end with that. OK, thank you. Um, Hendrik wants to say something now. I really appreciate what uh, Stan says, because uh, <laughs> we're looking at a uh, unified physics interface which gives us the opportunity to very easily swap out bits and pieces of physics. <clears throat> but the one thing we've learned from the communities uh, and community modeling is that uh, uh, you don't want to create more and more and more options. Uh, uh, for as successful as the WARF model is, it's a little daunting to realize that uh, with the options that you have in the three major elements of the physics package in the WARF, you can create about 1,000 different independent models just uh, 10 times 10 times 10, roughly. And uh, that's what we want to avoid. We want to we wanna also, in the physics, even with a unified physics package, having the capability of experiment easily, but we want to stay focused on a small set of physics. And so one of the keys really is scale-aware and stochastic, because the scale-aware will help us to have not different sets of physics for the hurricane model and for the, for the HER and for the CFS, try and see if we can, can, uh, can keep that into a scale of air package. And the stochastic part is essential because it gives you the, di the diversity that you need without having to maintain diversity of codes. Further comments, suggestions? Open floor doesn't have to be on anything specific. I was about to walk up to you. I'm not the anonymous on the questions, by the way. You didn't hear me before. Uh, I might have been, but in any event, um, this is a well. First, let me ask uh, Hendrick and Jeff and a couple others. I sent an email to with regard to a recommendation about providing an index of uh, available products. Did you want to discuss that or just respond back to the email? You mean like an inventory? Yeah, I had one, one of the things we find at Capital Weather Gang, and it's not unique to Capital Weather Gang, <clears throat> is it's a real zoo of products out there on the web. Uh, and <clears throat> it's really agonizing trying to find out what's there and how it might be used. Uh, you can go through every individual page and pick out your favorites. But for the general user, uh, it would be extremely helpful if there were a uh, searchable, 
uh, updated interactive index of each and every product, map, et cetera, that's being made available by uh, NSEP, the Weather Service more generally, uh, to help users find what they want, look at things that might be of use to them. Uh, I phrased it, I think, in saying the question was to private, um, how do you use the products? And my question, I reversed to say, uh, we don't know what products are out there, let alone how to use them. Three, three different answers to that. Since there's so many products and it's hard to find them, I have to give at least three different answers to. Uh, first of all, um, if you talk about operational things, um, I'm not trying to pass the buck, but that should really be through NOMADS and Prof. FTP, that should really be uh, provided as part of the operations through NCO. I'm talking about the web products, which are. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just one of three. Okay. Um, number two. The web-based products, most of those are <coughs> either uh, validation things or, or very specialized. We recognize it's a mess. We actually just made an inventory of trying to figure out where all our websites are. Um, NOAA or the Weather Service has made one or two attempts before to try and unify our websites. So far, the unification of the websites has been provided template. Well, that's useless. What we really need to do is we need to figure out corporately what the strategy is for how we put these things out. Without a strategy, uh, everything else is a Band-Aid. So uh, <coughs> we started that slowly over the last summer. Uh, Andrew went around and he has an inventory of where all the different websites are. Uh, we have, in principle, a commitment from headquarters to provide us some resources to actually systematically start looking at that and build a much more unified and simplified uh, set of websites. That sounds kind of familiar with uh, with uh, coding. And then <coughs> the, that's basically number two and number three. So we are having a, having an, an um, uh, we are working on getting an index done, and we are more importantly working on trying to figure out uh, what the proper strategic ways of doing this. Because right now uh, it is really a hotspot of of all kinds of uh, uh, good things and uh, some other things we need to do. I mean, Bob has been running uh, a marine website for oh, no, the one I won't say how long, how long, basically because the MAG, the MAG MAG website is really not for, not uh, not suitable for doing marine stuff. Uh, but that's just a fairly clear reason of why doing it. But the fact that every researcher has their own separate website for their own separate little project, that is something that we need to get away from. And we need we need to do this much more corporately. And we, we don't want to curtail people in being able to communicate, but we have to make a distinction <coughs> between those things that you use to internally communicate with your with your partners and those things that are open facing, so we'll we'll uh, we'll we should have much more to to talk about on the next production suite on that one. Well, I wasn't I was talking more more than just inventory of the website, but what's available within those in across various websites. Agreed, but if you don't know where your websites are, you don't know what's on the meter. Oh, yeah, that's the first step. In a more general question, unless someone else has got a question, on the issue, this isn't a wrench, especially, but a question on the setting up of requirements and look, focus on those as opposed to solutions. Well, the two really can't be separated. Um, the number of products being developed and on the shelf of value are found almost invariably on the different websites because the official product suite is deterministic in nature. And a good fraction of the ensembles, for example, are there on the website. I don't think many of them are available on AWIPS. I'm not sure, but certainly not all it could be of value. Um, so the question is, what kind of changes in the requirements are you looking at? I would suggest that it be transformed from an almost exclusively deterministic product suite to one which deals with providing information on certainties one way or the other. It doesn't necessarily have to be probabilities. It could be some well-defined level of confidence. And there are a number of alternative graphic products which I and others have developed. So unless there's a mandate that the product suite, the official product suite, will move to more of a, a, 
a, an uncertainty uh, feature, uncertainty dominated as opposed to deterministic dominated product suite. Um, at best, for example, the ensembles will be used, I gather, primarily just to come up with your single best forecast. And you're throwing out most of the valuable information intrinsic to those ensemble products. And it applies across the board to other products as well. So where are the requirements going to be coming from? Are they going to be based on what has been recommended here today by the various regions, which are just to support their deterministic database? Or are you going to be looking towards integrating something other than a strictly deterministic database? Product based. <laughs> I remain anonymous, number two. If this is Andy, can I take a shot at that? Steve, if you think we're just running the ensembles to come up with a deterministic forecast, then I think you missed the point of what we've been talking about for the last three years. I mean, we're using the ensemble data, but we have, you know, we're not, I don't want 30 runs going all the way down to the field offices. I mean, we need to be, that ensemble model data needs to be input to some sort of smart post-processing so we can tease the significant information out of it. And there's a, been a big, huge effort in that area over the last three, four, five years. I'm hopeful now that and then you well, two decades later, there is some serious uh, consideration being how to develop what I call user-friendly products not just sending out all the data of the individual members. That, of course, is just too overwhelming for anybody to use, even in a post-analysis post perspective, as Jeff pointed out. Okay. Are we finished on this one? Um, you've heard all the SSDs chiefs talk, talk about the importance of the RTMA IRMA. And a couple years ago, Bill Lapenta agreed to do twice a year upgrades, which has been really great. We've been making a lot of progress. So my two questions are, is that still in the plans to try to do twice a year upgrades? And where do you see the vision going in terms of what's coming next for the RTMA IRMA and that sort of stuff? The answer to your first question is yes, we're still looking to do twice a year. So we would incorporate that into our fixed schedule of implementation. Uh, again, that would probably be the only system that would be updated that frequently uh, in, the, in the production. Um, we want to add to the uh, suite of variables to complete the, the set in support of NDFD. Um, we certainly want to improve the quality, especially of the wind. And as Gene indicated, there is some side effort to improve the downscaling. Even, even when we have three kilometers in Alaska and CONUS from the, from the HREF, uh, we'll like there's still going to be features in, in the NDFD grid that the forecasters have to edit that won't be properly uh, resolved. So downscaling will still have a role, although it will be diminished role. Um, so we, in addition to the improvement, there's also a, there's two things. There's an effort. Uh, request from the FAA to move to 15-minute update. That's largely for ceiling and visibility. We don't know exactly how that's going to fit in to the, it might end up on IDP uh, as, as an RTMA two-dimensional bar system. But then there's also the effort, the RUA that Stan and Steve Ward and I had a little bit to do with to, to talk about. And now that is a three-dimensional update system in, for the real time. And that really does pose a question because we ultimately would like to have a component of that which is ensemble data assimilation uh, component, which makes the expense vastly more than our current 2D bar for our DNA. But that would be where we're headed. And since money speaks normally, uh, a lot of the RTMA acceleration was done with Sandy Supplemental Funds. Uh, the Sandy Supplemental Funds have run out. The effort has not run out. You're still having the same people working on it. Okay. Um, this is Bill Ward. Um, Joe Sinkowitz may want to step in on this one, too, since we're both uh, kind of largely uh, water-bound. <laughs> uh, but we're going to be in the not-too-distant future, and actually even Alaska may want to chime in here, too. Uh, we're going to be uh, 
coming into doing 10 kilometer grids over the high seas and it's going to be kind of the first time to where we actually have to deal with our land areas as well as all of the high seas and so I guess what I'm kind of asking here since we're going to be going down to 10 kilometers uh, I know the GFS is kind of coming out at 20 kilometers although it's native at 13 you know are we going to be stepping down again to where we can get proper guidance to you know create one-to-one -one grids with this area okay so I don't have an answer. I'm going to jump on his question, basically. And, and yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's 10 kilometer grids over an ocean area. Basically, um, it's, it's, the, it's the model. It's actually the concept of operations that our organization is doing. So we, we, I don't think that we really have a choice in a way unless there's another solution. I see Steve sitting over there tracking. And, and I know that there's discussion about the possibility of rather than doing deterministic grids to do probabilistic grids, but you can see where our organization is so far. Twenty, how many, how many years now, Steve? Is it like twenty-three, twenty-four? Right, right. It's a trouble swallowing. The G progress has been made just in the last few years when same sort of type of efforts could have been uh, going on for decades. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think we still have some, we still have issues. Alaska, uh, TAFB, the Hurricane Center, is where we all do uh, the large ocean areas. Uh, we've certainly had some exposure is to some of the methodologies that may work for a small area, and I will say that at two and a half times the CONUS, I can say that. Uh, just for our warning area, you're four times the CONUS. And we didn't conclude basically with the, the, the basin scale grid is probably five times the CONUS. So in, in, um, um, where I'm going is that some of the methodologies that have been proven and utilized, and Joaquin is an example that I'll say again, they don't work for large ocean grids, especially when you have high, high level uncertainty, bimodal uh, 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 distributions or predictions, uh, uh, trying to convey with the methodology that we have now for the tools that we have, and I don't, and I, I don't think Gene did either in his talk, that we really don't have a grasp as to how, what type of tools do we need in order to produce something. I know as an end, end users use grids. At sea, they have been doing it since about the time that we were doing, uh, uh, just going into ensembles, they've been using deterministic grids but I don't have an answer, Bill, as to how we're going to do it, except for the fact that I fear irrelevance. And if we're not able to produce either probabilistic grids, deterministic grids that reflect high Im impact, then I think well, irrelevance basically is what's going to occur. Okay, before I jump to Jeff, I was just going to say, Gene, you and Alaska were mentioned quite a bit. Um, interestingly, you're in the far upper left of the room, so I'm thinking of a map here, so I don't know if you placed yourself for that reason. Did, did you have anything to add, or was it well covered by uh, the various answers? Um, well, wait for the microphone if you could. And then you're... But I think one of the advantages that we do have is that our grids are actually three kilometers, even over the, our open waters. But we do suffer from the same issues that Joe was mentioning in terms of the process of how do we do this over that scale and how do we show um, you know, the, the, the often very narrow high wind bands at that scale with the guidance we currently have. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff. A yeah. uh, couple of questions about about IRMA, RTA, RTMA, one of them's for Jeff and the other's actually for BJ. Um, we had, as, as we went, we had a pretty good plan and there was a lot of talk about going down from five to two and a half kilometers. And I know we're, I'm, I'm, I think we're all very pleased with the NDFD and the IRMA at two and a half, but I'm just wondering, what we're thinking is, is there a next resolution? Is there a three to five, 10-year plan for where we're going to go? Are we, are, we, are we kind of 
trying to catch our breath up to two and a half before we make the next leap? That's that's question number one for Jeff. Question number two is I Jeff talks a lot about the importance of the Irma for the for the regional models and the but I I never really is the Irma going to be the gold standard for the GFS, or is because it does the resolution only extends over the Kona space? What is is the Irma the, the gold standard, or are you planning on going to the gold standard as as va validating for the GFS and the NGGPS? Um, before you answer, real quick, uh, we have about three minutes left, and the the same kind of flavor of some of this. Discussions can continue uh, after lunch, but um, I just before you guys answer, just um, we're looking at about three more minutes. So, so the answer on the RTMA resolution is two and a half for now, and and when the weather service moves or when the forecast offices move to using a higher resolution, then that will likely drive us our requirement for the RTMA and Irma, and we would strive to meet it. Uh, so on the global scale, yes, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we are talking about tens of kilometers rather than uh, single digit. So the processes are slightly different. It's more expensive to, to do that kind of a data simulation at higher resolution. But even the DA system, the current existing uh, operations is at a lower resolution than the forecast model. So, uh, but certainly, yes, that, that, that's the kind of a gold standard. Uh, but over over the land surface, the GLDAS, for instance, the MICEX uh, land group, uh, they're working on the global land data simulation, then putting uh, the surface variables into the GDAS. So these are all planned uh, stages of, uh, you know, you heard, uh, we heard a lot of problems in terms of not being able to match the radius on profiles or the surface station or the corners. So that's going to be our immediate uh, attention area, and then eventually a more integrated uh, data assimilation system that accounts for uh, a more realistic uh, ground truth assimilation. Okay, thanks, VJ. Um, we'll uh, we'll break for lunch now. Come back at 1:20 when we've set aside uh, at that time. We've set aside an open discussion on the future of the model production suite. Um, so we can continue the flavor of these discussions, and then we've uh, allocated two hours for that, or almost two hours. So looking forward to that uh, lively discussion. Thank you.